The entire Vanguard Zombies storyline explained. In today's Call of Duty Zombies lore video, I want to go over the entire plot point of Vanguard Zombies, how it relates to Cold War and the rest of the Dark Aether saga, and what it means for the future of the storyline. This video provides all of the necessary information you need to know nice and concisely. Vanguard Zombies is a prequel to the events of Black Ops Cold War Zombies, and adds millions of years worth of history to the Dark Aether dimension, the demented place below and mirroring reality, providing much needed world building so there is a lot of information to cover before we even reach Dur and Fang. Feel free to watch my video on the entire Cold War Zombie story after you are done with this one. Anyways, with that being said, let's begin. According to the inhabitants of the Dark Aether, their realm has existed since time began, and since then they have been in a constant state of war with one another, forming tribes, clans, and royal bloodlines that would last for millions of years. In all honesty, the Vanguard Zombie story itself isn't as important as the world building that the game has provided to the Dark Aether. It is important to bring to attention here that this constant state of unrest in the Dark Aether was happening all throughout the events of the Aether storyline, many thousands of cycles, and even more significantly, the entities within the Dark Aether were unaware that there was even ever another realm outside of their own. These warring clans of the Dark Aether came in many different shapes and sizes, all with their own desires and agendas, but in the most ancient days of the Dark Aether, they were united by one thing, their worship of the Construct. The Construct is a giant monolith that hovers above the Dark Aether, believed to even predate time itself. Whilst it appears to be made of stone, it is a sentient being and is all-powerful. The Construct had no care for the entities worshipping it, however it was constantly watching, with some even believing it to be judging life's worthiness to keep existing. On very rare occasions, however, after an individual completed a series of arduous trials, the construct would imbue them with a small portion of its infinite power, at which point that individual would become the Archon. Throughout the history of the Dark Aether, there have been at least four Archons, though there have possibly been more. The first Archon used his power to eradicate a parasitic species that was plaguing the Dark Aether. The fourth Archon shattered the moon into pieces and weaponized those shards which still hang above the Dark Aether. The origins of the Construct are unclear, but with it being there since the Dark Aether itself, it is a wonder if the first Archon could have been Dr. Monty. At the very least, Dr. Monty and the Shadow Man were probably aware of the Construct's existence. As millennia passed, one clan rose to prominence in the Dark Aether and eventually were considered its lords. They had yet to control the entire realm, but one particularly ambitious son of this bloodline would seek to change that. His name was Cortifex the Deathless. Through guile and deception, Cortifex's plans eventually culminated in the murder of his parents and his official ascension to Lord of the Dark Aether. He also took a wife, Sarakix, that was adamant on not wanting a child. Dark Aether entities do not die of old age and so having a child to further his line was not a requirement and was seen by him as a threat, as the child could do to him what he did to his own parents. At some point following this, Cortifex became obsessed with the Construct, seeing it as the ultimate way to dominate the Dark Aether. He was able to successfully pass the trials, but upon appealing to the living monolith, it refused him for reasons unknown. Cortifex flew into such a rage over this that he would dispatch his five personal assassins, the Sisters of Agony, to remove anyone else who would try and petition the Construct. Eventually, Seraxis became impregnated with his child, and in rage, Cortifex set out to punish both her and the child. He transformed Sarakix into a shadow of her former self, erasing her memories and changing her physical form to that of the newest sister of Agony. He then performed an unspeakable act of cruelty on the child, which we don't have confirmation on exactly what he did. At some point, mysterious objects of great power appeared in the Dark Aether without warning. These were the many creatures and artifacts that were banished to this realm by Primus Nikolai at the end of Tag to Totem, such as the Ray Gun, the Pack-a-Bunch Machine, and the Mystery Box. This was, of course, when the prior multiverse collapsed into the Dark Aether, leaving only but one singular linear timeline universe. With all of the entities, items, and beings of the Aether being sent in there, this was an eye-opening event for the denizens of the Dark Aether, as they had believed that their reality was the only one. Now aware of other beings, they attempted to gaze beyond at the dimensional veil, but after locating Earth, all they found were little more than cavemen, clearly far too primitive to have designed objects like the Pack-a-Punch machine. Regardless, some entities took interest in the newly discovered humans and began to interact with the 
various emerging civilizations, though they were rather limited in what they were able to do. Saraxis, for example, appearing in fire and crystal balls, but unable to do much else. After some discussion, Saraxis the Shadow and Belakar the Warlock devised a way for them to cross over into the other dimension, through objects they called artifacts. They would craft an item that would appeal to a given human culture, bind their own essence to it, and cast it through the dimensional veil. Once picked up by a human, they could bond to them, allowing the human to use some of their power. Saraxis created a dragon with the intent on being sent to the Japanese. They went on to believe her to be a Kitsune, a mischievous fox spirit. Belakar creates a mask for the Maya in South America, and Victor the Destroyer, a legendary soldier of the Dark Aether, crafted a short sword to be used by the heroes of Greece, who initially viewed him as the god of war, Ares. After bonding with the Greek hero, Achilles, and helping him in the siege of Troy, their two legends became inseparable, and Invictor would later be believed to be the spirit of Achilles himself. Nauticus the Conqueror, commander of Cortifex's Night Legions, created a war horn, which was received by the Norsemen, who believed him to be the Emir, the father of the Frost Giants. Cortifex, however, put very little thought into his artifact, simply putting two pyramids onto a stick, and sent it to ancient Egypt, where it was received by the pharaohs themselves. All of these entities would have an influential impact on these world's cultures, being seen as gods and demons over the many years, shaping religion, myths, and legends. Cortifex's expansionism culminated in the Nether Wars, his final attempt to attain total control of the Dark Aether. With Nauticus in command of his forces, he set about destroying any resistance in his path. Belakar the Warlock, chief among a clan of scholars and historians, was among the first to resist Cortifex. Similarly, Saraxis, despite having no memory of her previous life, believed she could not continue a service to Cortifex and fled the sisters. Now she also opposed him. As Cortifex approached the vast wilds of the Dark Aether, he commanded the nature worshipping clan who lived within to submit to him. After refusing, Cortifex had his Sisters of Agony, now with one less member, to kill all who dwelled within, whilst his Night Legions burned the forest to the ground. This, however, was an oversight by the Deathless, as, unbeknownst to him, this clan had the ability known as the Web of Life. When one member died, their life force and power was redistributed to the rest of the clan. Unfortunately for Cortifex, one single member survived, the Kanna, and she was now effectively immortal. Sometime following this, at the Battle of Obsidian Ridge, Invictor the Destroyer, legendary soldier, fled the battlefield, eventually finding his way to Belakar's resistance. Cortifex, seeing Saraxis was still meddling in affairs on Earth, whilst equally being a thorn in his side, set about dealing with his former wife once and for all. He crafted a new kind of artifact, a bronze mirror, and cast it through the dimensional veil to a small swampy island in Okinawa, on the Japanese archipelago. This island was where Saraxis had first crossed over from the Dark Aether to the human world, world, and she often had her host come back to visit. At the time, around the Edo period, Saraxis was in possession of the Lord of the Island. Cortifex contacted the priesthood of the island under the guise of a friendly spirit, and informed them that their lord was being possessed by a demon, but they could use the mirror to free him. The priest did just this, and, after forcing Saraxis back into her artifact, buried it on the island. Belakar and Vakana eventually met at the site on the latter's birth, in the corrupted lands that now stood where the wilds once were. They mastered minded the plot to defeat Cortifex, involving forcing him into his artifact and trapping him on Earth. Following this, and having seen the power that the opposition now held, Nauticus the Conqueror saw that Cortifex had no hope of winning and fled to the Resistance himself. Now alone, the Resistance closed in on Cortifex and banished him to our reality. However, in the process, they ended up doing the same to themselves. We have no exact date for this, but it was seemingly sometime prior to World War I and after the Edo period in Japan. The Societe Accord as the Dark Aether entities had consistently meddled with humanity throughout their existence, certain humans took notice and attempted to consolidate their own power through the forbidden knowledge and magic that the Dark Aether entities could provide. Beginning as secret priesthoods, these individuals eventually banded together in medieval Europe as the Societe Occult. These individuals, through their conversations with the Dark Aether entities, were able to learn rune magic, the method of channeling Ethereum used by all the Dark Aether entities, allowing them to quickly become the puppet masters 
members of the continent's politics. Eventually, they had learned enough to compile the Tome of Rituals, a book containing hundreds of rune magic spells. It is worth noting that now with this knowledge of rune magic, we can retroactively look at the old Aether story, at Element 115, and the fact that the Apothecans and Keepers seemingly used rune magic. The society were constantly changing their location to maintain secrecy, until one of their leaders, Lucien Porret, a man in contact with Nauticus, erected the Hotel Real in Paris. He chose the location as the intersection of the catacombs beneath the street, which were in the pattern of a dark ether rune, allowing them to channel an incredible amount of power at the location. We learn that areas of mass death slash casualty cause weak points between the regular universe and the dark ether, weakening the dimensional veil. Considering that the Nagdor and Totem Bunker keeps appearing throughout zombies and just so happens to be the spot of the first breach in the dimensional veil, it really makes you wonder just what exactly happened at this site to create such dimensional fragility. Even once the Dark Ether entities had been banished to Earth, the members of the Societe continued to hold rituals at the Hotel Real, allowing them to contact the entities across the world trapped in their artifacts. However, in the 1920s, some unknown catastrophe caused the Societe to split the Tome of Rituals and hide the pages. This may well coincide with the severing of the connection between our world and the Dark Aether, which made the artifacts fall dormant. Diva Height At the outbreak of World War II, Gabriel Kraft, professor of demonology at Leipzig University, was approached by SS Oberführer Wolfram von Liszt, the great uncle of Dr. Jaeger. Von Liszt was the commanding officer of the SS Diva Height Battalion. Von Liszt was of the belief that Germany's true victory lay in exotic sources of power, such as Thor's Hammer, the Holy Grail, and Atlantis, and was recruiting academics to help him locate the supposed sources, in order to gain a strategic advantage over the Allies, and enabled through Reich Führer Heinrich Himmler's obsession with the occult. After refusing to help von Liszt, Kraft's assistant is shot dead, leaving the professor with no choice, and after being taken into captivity, von Liszt tells Kraft that his husband, Sasha, has been captured. In reality, von Liszt had already executed Sasha, but pretended he was still alive in order to keep Kraft working. Eventually, Kraft was able to locate a page from the Tome of Rituals, and using that was able to locate the other scattered artifacts. However, to his dismay, they were inactive. That all changed, however, when Project End Station punched a hole in the dimensional veil. When that occurred, the artifacts woke up. Von List, unaware of this development at End Station, who were de Varheit's rivals, touched the scepter of Cortifex, only to suddenly bond with the ancient entity. Suddenly, Cortifex promised Von List that he would give him an army with which he could win the war single-handedly. All he needed to do was get him back to the Dark Aether, where he could claim the construct. Von List agreed and took his battle Leon, including Professor Kraft, to war-torn Stalingrad, where hundreds of Nazi mass graves lay in wait. After arriving and setting up in a dilapidated office building, Kraft decided he could no longer sit idly by and bonded with Belica through her mask. Kraft began planning with the ancient scholar on how best to defeat Cortevex, but was forced to allow her to retreat back into her artifacts, as Kraft's body was not strong enough to support the possession of the Dark Aether entity, though the two maintained a mental link. He sent out a distress call which four allied commandos answered, reaching the square in Stalingrad just as Von List erected a powerful barrier spell. This is their Fang. Kraft sealed himself in his office using a spell from the Tome of Rituals and lowered the four artifacts to the commandos out of his window in a small wooden box. Now imbued with the power of their new partners, Kraft's special forces began the fight against Von List. The special forces team were able to access multiple theatres of Devar Heights operation, including Merville, where Von List planned to rally his undead army, the Hotel Real, where Devar Heights were trying to secure any last traces of the Societe occult, and the Akinawan Swamp, where Saraxis first crossed over now an Imperial Japanese outpost and Divar Heights excavation site. While striking back against Von List, the commandos encounter a page from the Tome of Rituals, sealed in a powerful void spell, but are unable to break through and acquire the page. Belica, undeterred, began sending messages into the Dark Aether, and, eventually, her old ally responded, Vakana the Last. Vakana, creating an artifact so she can aid the special forces as well, manifests a portal that allows the allies to leave Cortifex's barrier spell and arrive at the ruins of Cortifex's temple, where Divahite had recently been operating. 
Terra Maledicta. Reaching the eastern desert and the ruins of Cortifex's temple, which had been blown up by Devarhite, the Special Forces team took note of large Dark Aether crystals which had begun to sprout up around the area. With Vakana's help, the team were able to resurrect the Decimator, an old general of the Night Legions whom Cortifex had merged with his own shield as punishment. Restoring his spark of life, the Decimator lent the team the power they required in order to break through the Void Spell and acquire the Tome Page. After the Tome Page was stolen, and Divahite transferred all remaining personnel back to the Eastern Desert. This included personnel at the Shinonuma evacuation site, who promptly left for Egypt upon Von Liss' orders. Leaving behind radio equipment, electric traps, and the experimental Wunderwaffe DG2, developed by end stations Ulrich Vogel. Based on calculations from Dr. Oscar Strauss for Divahite, potentially based on remnants from the Dark Aether on Richthofen's original design. With Kraft receiving the page through his link with Belakar, he realizes that it points to the location of the relic mirror that Cortifex had used on Seraxis centuries ago, and that they must return to the Japanese Swamp of Death where it had been hidden. Shinonuma Reborn Returning to Devarhite's excavations, with the excavation site left unattended, the Special Forces team set out to uncover the lost relic mirror that Devarhite had failed to find. In order to locate it, Vakana suggested restoring Seraxis's lost memories utilizing powerful rune magic. When asked about the relic that had been used to separate her from a former home, Seraxis stated that she couldn't remember and that there were big gaps in her memory, including a youth in the Dark Aether. Vakana then stated there was a monolith at the swamp that could help Seraxis remember, instructing the Special Forces to find it. In the meantime, the Special Forces also managed to assemble the parts to and craft the Wunderwaffe DG2, with this summoning an ethereal echo of Seraxis's past self. The Special Forces are forced to subdue the angry memory until it gives in and reveals to Seraxis the truth of her past, that she was caught Cortifex's wife, traumatizing her with rage. Furthermore, however, the commandos learn of the construct and Cortifex's obsession with it. Now with the relic mirror in hand, they leave the swamp and return back to the eastern desert, though are alarmed at what they find upon their arrival. The Archon Shortly before the arrival of Kraft's special forces team, Cortifex convinces Von List that the success of the Allies are, in large part, due to their ability to use the Pack-a-Punch machine, and suggests that they can perform a rune spell in order to trap the machine between this world and the Dark Aether. Agreeing, Von Liss performs the spell. However, to his horror, the cost of the ritual was the lives of all of the remaining Devarhite soldiers. Unbeknownst to the Oberfuhrer, however, this was all in accordance to Cortifex's plan. Now, Aether pockets filled the landscape, allowing the rapid acceleration of crystal growth and the total pollution of the air, these pockets being areas where the Dark Aether bleeds into our world. With no support, Von Liss hides away alongside the scepter of Cortifex. Arriving on the site and seeing the the trapped Pack-a-Punch machine, Nauticus points out that if they can restore the machine, they will be able to use the mirror to trace the spell to its source, Cortifex, and pull his scepter to them, finally separating him from Von List. The commandos succeed in restoring the machine and finally pull Cortifex to them, but are shocked to find that they have just played directly into the Deathless's hands, and every failure Devarhite has committed so far has been part of his grand plan to get to this exact place. With the Dark Aether bleeding so profusely into this location, now, Cortifex is able to manifest physically and opens a rift directly to the Construct, though not before one final farewell present to Von List, teleporting him unarmed into Kraft's office. Kraft's team follow Cortifex into the Dark Aether and witness him petitioning the Construct for the second time in his life. Upon seeing the Special Forces team, he asks the Construct to let him kill them, though it denies him, informing him that they must all abide by rules that it has set. As a result, the Construct sends them back to Earth and gives them the opportunity to to pass the trials. With Von List informing them on the trials of mindfulness, sacrifice, and resilience, based on what Cortifex had told him, the Special Forces team are eventually successful in their attempts, removing the ethereal chains from the rift that will take them to the Construct. Before they leave, however, Von List reveals to Kraft that Sasha was killed by him years ago, and that the letters he had received were penned by Von List, feigning Sasha's affection. Filled with righteous fury, Kraft shoots Von List, killing him instantly. Finally ready to proceed, Kraft's commandos enter the Dark Aether one last time, though arrive too late, and witness Cortifex's transformation into the Construct's next Archon. Fighting off hordes of revenants, and with nothing seemingly able to harm Cortifex, Vakana points out that thanks to the Construct's overwhelming power, the anemones that used to live throughout the wilds have woken back up from their long hibernation, and are growing once more. Taking Dark Aether crystals, they feed the anemones only for them to spit out a far more volatile crystal. Floating above their battle, the commandos 
notice the shards of the moon left by the fourth Archon, and they throw the crystals at these ancient weapons, the resulting reaction causing them to fly at the construct and interrupt its connection with Cortifex, leaving him temporarily vulnerable. Kraft's team press the attack and eventually defeats Cortifex, with the construct vanishing and his body, according to Nauticus, falling to the bottomless depths of the Dark Aether. So what exactly is next following on from the events of Vanguard Zombies? Well, the ending of Vanguard Zombies has been regarded by some as unsatisfactory as it leaves many questions without a set in stone conclusion or connection to Cold War Zombies, but given what we know from Black Ops Cold War, we can make somewhat of an educated guess as to what occurs from here. Firstly, the Dark Aether entities, now back in the Dark Aether, likely leave the Special Forces team and go back to their lives in that realm. Due to the power vacuum left by Court Effects, it's entirely possible that they devolve into fighting amongst themselves, but regardless, they are all consumed by the onset of Zykov. Zykov himself is likely the next Archon following Court Effects, this explaining the looming question in Cold War of just how did Court Effects get so much power so quickly. Zykov even noted of stumbling along a giant deceased Elder God in the Dark Aether that looked as if it had been in battle, that of which could have been the remnants of Court Effects that he went on to consume. He also made note of giant futuristic mechanical-like devices in the Dark Aether, and it wonder if he may have seen the construct, since it does have a futuristic looking aesthetic. After all, it almost lives outside of time. In addition, there's the possibility that the Societea cult go on to make up the uber-rich elite members financing Project Janus that Eddie Richtofen was putting in motion throughout the events of Cold War Zombies for his own currently unknown agenda. And since Requiem Archives seem to have tons of information and artifacts from the Vanguard Zombie story, could Eddie be in possession of the Tome of Rituals? Only time will tell. Another loose end is Mr. P. Given his appearance in Vanguard Zombies, it suggests he may in fact be the child of Cortifex and Seraxis, and the cruelty that Cortifex enacted on the child was actually the act of transforming him into the form of Mr. Peaks. Given Cortifex can morph the physical forms of other entities, such as the Decimator, it is entirely possible here too. And I've already speculated about the significance and possible tie-in to Eddie Richthofen's child in prior videos. It is worth noting that the Zealot Spragmos prophesizes that the Old Ones will return post the ending of Cold War Zombies. With the Forsaken captured in the containment chamber, it seems to have freed the old ones he consumed. The Construct could also play a major role next game too, with the potential for a new Archon. Maybe that could end up being Samantha Maxis, who is now trapped in the Dark Aether, or even a goal for Eddie Richthofen and his project Janus. Only time will tell. However, the Construct does seem to do more than just electing Archons and determines the fate of the Dark Aether, so it could play a role in the future story in another fashion. Finally, we have Gabriel Kraft, who is still very much alive by the end of Vanguard Zombies. It is unlikely he survives until the 1980s, given the fact that he would likely be the first person Requiem would want to hire, but it's entirely possible that he influences the story we see in Cold War in a more indirect way. As we saw in Cold War, his notes are still present in the Requiem archives, so that relationship is likely something we will learn about in the sequel to Black Ops Cold War. Where Vanguard ends, the latter half of D-Machine's intel picks up. It seems that the failure of Duvarheit's Operation Revenant and the loss of Normandy contribute to the renewed interest from Hitler himself in Project End Station and the eventual development of Operation Baldra. The Chaos Story. As a side note, a lot of people were curious after the release of Shinonuma Reborn, as in a piece of intel, Gabriel Kraft mentions that the artifacts of the Dark Aether are similar to items mentioned by an Alistair Rose, called Sentinel Artifacts. Many people have taken this to mean that the Chaos storyline from Black Ops 4 is canon to the Dark Aether storyline. However, this isn't necessarily the case. When Kraft mentions Rhodes, he says he is an amateur demonologist, and that the Sentinel Artifacts he wrote about were never found. This is a huge contrast to the Chaos storyline where Alistair Rhodes is a world-famous archaeologist. This likely points to the idea that whilst there is an Alistair Rhodes in this dimension, none of the supernatural aspects of the Chaos storyline exist, leading Rhodes to essentially be a nobody. It is, however, possible that the Chaos story merely existed within the prior multiverse that was reset on Tag the Totem, with no real crossover to our current day story. What is interesting, however, is that Trek are taking ideas and themes from Chaos that were never really fleshed out and are reusing them for the Dark Aether saga, such as the idea of entities from another dimension altering the course of human history, or a secret society in control of Western civilization, just like the Order. As a result, we may potentially see familiar faces from the Chaos story return in the future, but they will likely be very different from their counterparts from within that old storyline that seemed to have been cut in Black Ops 4 Zombies.
The perks in Vanguard Zombies grant the player the powers of demon blood, or to be more realistic, the blood of entities within the Dark Aether. When consumed, this blood becomes a part of the Special Forces team. If we think about this from the scientific perspective we got in Cold War, this is no different to developing powers from Ethereum exposure on a large scale, like we see with Samantha, but on a smaller scale, the exact thing that happens when we drink perks in Cold War. Yet more interesting new information about the Pack-a-Punch is that the entities are unaware of who made it, Invictus says whoever it was, they must have been a genius at the forge. Maybe a reference to Jeb Brown, the machine's original creator. Invictus specifically also gives us two pieces of information which are quite shocking given everything we know so far. The first is that he says he has seen such crucibles like this in the Dark Aether and that they use powerful magic, implying that in this new world without Element 115, the method of upgrading weapons uses a form of Dark Aether rune magic and that other beings in the Dark Aether have been doing it for a while. With that being said, that is the conclusion to the entire storyline of Vanguard Zombies and potentially the last of Treyarch Zombies content until 2024. The story mainly helped our understanding of the Dark Aether with much needed world building and retroactively changed and added to our understanding of the Dark Aether even pre-tagged a totem in the Aetherverse too. Because of this, I intend on making an updated video covering the entire Aether and Dark Aether story sometime soon to get you caught up in time for Treyarch's next Zombies installment, whatever that may be and whenever that may Maybe. I do also plan on making a video on what to expect in terms of the storyline for Trek's next COD Zombies game, with all of the storyline beats and threads that have been left over from Black Ops Cold War and Vanguard Zombies. I also want to give a huge thank you to the Call of Duty Zombies wiki, as some of this information in this video is from there. In the meantime, we will just be waiting for Trek's next game. Be sure to drop a like and subscribe if you want to see more storyline content on the channel, since people don't seem to be covering it as much nowadays, but I'm trying to keep everyone up to date with it. With that being said, thank you for watching, and uh... Bye.